So we'll just give a minute or so for make sure that our folks can uh, admit all the people from the uh, waiting room in before we get started. Um, just want to say how excited I am uh, to have these uh, folks here. Um, I've known Drew and Frank a long time. Uh, Frank, I met when I was working as a chief of staff of the New Hampshire House, and he was a candidate in 2012 for state rep. And he kept coming up to Concord a couple of times a week and asking all these questions. And I remember thinking to myself, "Man, this guy is this guy is going to be the most prepared freshman rep in history." Um, I also thought, "Thank God there aren't 400 of them." Um, and Drew, I know, uh, been known, known Drew for a, a really long time. Uh, know him so well that I helped set him up with his wife. Uh, I think you're, you're muted there, Drew. That is true. Awesome. I think we're just about uh, just about uh, cleared out the waiting room, so I think we're going to get started here. Just want to welcome everybody to coming and, and listening to this presentation today, this discussion forum on education in a post-COVID-19 world or, or a current COVID-19 world. Uh, we're thrilled to have everybody here today. My name is Greg Moore. I am the State Director with Americans for Prosperity here in New Hampshire. I'm thrilled to have a, a great group of folks here to talk about how the state has responded, uh, what the implications of this are, where potentially some gaps might be, and how we're working to try to fix those gaps to make this the best educational opportunity for all the children across the state of New Hampshire. Our two, our two uh, featured guests tonight are Education Commissioner Frank Edelblue. Uh, he runs uh, what is actually the second largest state agency in state government behind the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Everybody here today, the Department my of Education. Is I am a uh, state a critical role Americans of, for prosperity, uh, maintaining all laws, rules, and policies, and more importantly, focusing on providing the best educational opportunities for, uh, for, for the students across the state of New Hampshire. We also have uh, with us Drew Klein. Drew is the uh, chairman of the State Board of Education. That board has the responsibility for overse overseeing and setting uh, state policy for education, where the state is, is uh, moving forward and uh, making sure that the, the direction that we are headed in a way to give uh, our students across the state of New Hampshire the best opportunity to have, have uh, a strong education. Uh, with us joining us as well, we also have our two moderators. Our first moderator is uh, Sharon Osborne. Sharon is the founder and director of Latitude Learning Resources, a nonprofit homeschool learning center in Manchester. Uh, she's a private sector entrepreneur and has helped manage several nonprofits and homeschools her three children. In addition to that, we have Sarah Scott. Sarah Scott is our deputy director of grassroots operations for AFP New Hampshire, and she handles K to 12, uh, K to 12 educational issues for us. So uh, with that, I just want to point out that we have a, a, a very large number of people on, uh, on the presentation today and, uh, and, and uh, we do want to have an opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, the, the way you will do that is by going into the chat. You will see a chat function, and you will have the opportunity to, to uh, put any questions you might have in that little chat function. So at the bottom of the screen, you should see a button that says chat. Click on that and enter any questions you might have. And once we uh, get through with a little bit of a discussion with Drew and Frank, we'll start moving to some of the, the questions that, that we get in. I know some folks have submitted questions uh, in advance of this meeting, and we'll try to get through some of those as well. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Sharon Osborne, uh, who will uh, begin our discussion. Thank you so much, Sharon. Absolutely. Thank you, Greg. All right. This is a question for both Chairman Klein and Commissioner Edelblue. What does remote learning look like in New Hampshire right now? What have been the biggest successes, and where have we fallen short? I think, Frank, you uh, should take a lead on that one. You want me to take the lead on that one? Okay. Um, well, so first of all, thank you all for joining us tonight and uh, tuning in. Hopefully we can answer many of your questions. I'm going to try and move through these questions uh, as quickly as possible to get to the questions that folks might have so they can type them into the chat. I'm also going to encourage everybody to um, go to a website, not now, but after this call or maybe some other time. It's called nhlearnsremotely.com nhlearnsremotely.com. We've got all kinds of resources and information about uh, remote instruction and support out there for you to connect up to. 
And so basically what I want to just share with you is the framework that we have. And again, we can drill down on this as deeply as you want to go, but the framework around uh, New Hampshire's approach to distance learning is a little formula that basically says remote instruction plus remote support results in remote learning for our students. Um, we knew early on in this process that the instruction aspect um, was something that was kind of within the wheelhouse of an education system. And we felt uh, we had a better shot at being successful at pivoting uh, from an in-classroom instructor-led type of uh, instruction model to a remote instruction model. So there's a lot of details about how we're doing that and we'll probably get into those tonight. Um, but then the other aspect is really remote support. And this is recognizing that our students who are engaging um, in their education system, especially in this uh, distance learning model, are going to be coming at it with all different kinds of perspectives and needs and circumstances. And so trying to find ways to be able to support all of them so that they can be successful uh, with the goal of remote learning. And so that is really kind of the framework that we have around remote learning in New Hampshire. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, um, not very much. I mean, I think that said it very well, but, um, you know, New Hampshire, we are um, very focused on the districts, and this is very dis much a district-led um, effort. So you're seeing different districts um, experiment and take different approaches and figure out what works best for them. So it's not going to look the same across the entire state. All right, this question is for our commissioner. What have been some of the surprises uh, that you've encountered with the move to remote learning? And what do we know now that we didn't expect? Right, so probably one of the biggest surprises, and I hope I'm okay in sharing this particular surprise, uh, was how successfully we were able to pivot. And I say it was a surprise, not because the, the skill and the capability of everybody who was trying to pivot was not there, but it was a big move, right? In other words, like we made a decision and in a very short amount of time, we were pivoting to uh, remote instruction and support. Um, and I think even today, and, and I'm guessing a little bit, but I think we all across the state are looking at this and saying, wow, that was amazing at how smoothly it went, how well we've pulled it off. It has certainly not been without hiccups. There've been a lot of issues and we continue to work very hard around those issues to solve all of the various problems. Um, but certainly the ability to pivot so quickly, I think was one of the advantages um, and, and sort of the surprises in that system. Um, I think another surprise that is really um, a pleasant surprise and encouraging uh, is that um, how well really all of the different constituent groups across the state are working well together. We are keeping student learning um, centered and focused in front of us and are trying to drive uh, you know towards that on all different kinds of front on all different kinds of fronts. And so, you know, folks are really collaborating well together. They're being creative. They're being innovative with the primary goal of bright futures for our students in front of them and just working together to, uh, to accomplish that, really. All right. For um, Chairman Klein, what does this mean for education going forward? Do you think education in the state of New Hampshire is going to change over the long run um, as a result of this? And what rules have been highlighted that can be adjusted to improve education on the whole? That's a great question. I, I don't think it's, <clears throat> I don't think we can tell right now what education is going to look like going forward and what changes um, we might want to make. We're still learning as this process unfolds and we still have a bit of the uh, school year to go to try to gather information and we are doing a lot of listening right now we're trying to understand how districts are dealing with this what encounter uh, what problems they're encountering and um, doing a lot of listening but I think so far um, we have no plans to, <laughs> right now um, but we can pick up a couple of things so the first one is we had to make an emergency rule change to allow this to happen at all so that was 
one immediate thing that we looked at was how do we create the flexibility going forward for districts to be able to deal with situations um, without having to come get an emergency rule. So we at the state board have been thinking for a little while about <clears throat> the idea that in New Hampshire, we have a lot of local autonomy that is granted to the districts by the states, but we still don't have a real entrepreneurial mindset given from the state. And by that, I mean the rules are still pretty restrictive on what districts can and can't do in terms of management. And so one way to think about this going forward is how can we take a look at those rules and allow or rather enable districts and principals to be a little bit more entrepreneurial and a little more flexible and deal with situations as they come up and do what is in their students or their district's best interests um, without coming to the state with a mother may I for things. So previously the rule said in emergency, you, you can only do remote learning for five days. <clears throat> well, we're gonna look at that <laughs> and see, well, do we need to keep that five day limit? Can we just have the allowance for districts to do remote learning going forward? So they don't have to come get permission to state. So that's one thing. Um, we're also looking at training. So this was, as uh, as the commissioner said, um, this is a huge experiment conducted very quickly. And I have been incredibly impressed with how the districts have handled it, with how the teachers have stepped up and just made it happen. I've been really impressed with how student focused so many people in this process have been from the very beginning. There was a lot of teamwork, a lot of pulling together and setting aside the drama, not trying to figure out how can I get out of this what's best for me, but figuring out how can we make this work right now for the kids. And that was really encouraging. And with that going forward, we need to look at if something like this happens again or if districts decide, you know what, remote learning really works for some of our kids. Outside of the context of an emergency, maybe that's something some districts would wanna do, but emergency or not, one of the things that we don't have in place right now is a rule that says all educators have to be trained for remote learning. Um, you've got teachers who've been in, the, in their districts for a long time, some of them been in here for decades, and maybe don't have the kind of experience or training on computers or on the technology that um, would be optimal. So I think going forward, there's ability to look at um, what we require of universities in terms of what they, how they train teachers and what we require of teacher credentials to make sure that every teacher is prepared to, to do something like this going forward, to deal with this kind of instruction. You know, Sharon, I think I'd like to just weigh in on that a little bit as well, kind of just more broadly again. Um, and that is, you know, we think about, you know, I think your question was about, you know, what does this mean for education? And there's been a little bit of a shift. Like when you think about education, typically you're thinking about the, the, the students learning. Um, but I would say that in this experience, you know, like I like to say, students were learning, parents were learning, like they're learning a lot about what's going on with their kids' education because it's happening right there in the living room sometimes. You know, teachers are learning, you know, district administrators are learning, uh, state officials are learning, like we're all in this process of learning together. And so that attitude of learning and being a continuous learner, I think bodes well for our future uh, because this isn't the only kind of obstacle that we're going to face in education. There's always going to be stuff going on. But if we embrace that idea of like, okay, so something's happening here. What can we learn from it? What can we uh, glean from this to help ourselves move forward rather than imagine that there's this stasis of a system, um, you know, and it's only the kids who are learning. Um, I think it will bode well for our state. And I think it's important to recognize that that, um, that state success, um, you know, really was recognized nationally, uh, you know, by, you know, leaders on a national level. Um, you know, New Hampshire was fast to move in terms of 
uh, getting set up for remote instruction and support. I saw an article today about one state. Uh, they have been working since they shut down, you know, a number of weeks ago uh, on their a plan for how they were going to get to this point. And they were hoping that next week or the week after they would start remote instruction for their kids. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, these poor kids were basically sent home to watch TV and do games for weeks while everybody figured out what they were going to do. Um, you know, and our educators, our families, um, our leaders said, that's not how we're going to do it here in New Hampshire. We're going to continue to push forward. And uh, so just that whole kind of attitude, I think, is going to be beneficial on a long-term basis for New Hampshire. So along with that positive attitude, we have the difficulty that not everybody is, let's say, proficient at um, online learning or online resources. So how do you help those families and students and even teachers um, adapt to this change we've had to all online learning? Yeah, so first of all, I would just like uh, take a look at the premise that we're all on online learning. In fact, we're not all online. Um, we have some districts that are 100% online. We have some districts that are still very much analog uh, in terms of how they're delivering. And then we've got some that are kind of a hybrid of both. Where you see mostly all analog is truthfully in the younger grades in some of our more rural districts. Um, but certainly there was a bit of a learning curve that again, we're all learners in this process. So we had students who had to learn some of the technology. They had to figure out how they were gonna engage their uh, instructional materials in kind of that digital uh, cyberspace type of a world. We had parents who were supporting kids and they weren't accustomed to that. It was interesting, uh, one particular story was I got a call um, last week, or actually it might've been two weeks ago at this point in time, um, by a great grandmother who had a third grader at home. And she was like, okay, I'm really trying to help my kid, but I'm not sure I know how to do this. And so her, her third grader probably had greater technology skills than she did. Um, but I just like reached out to the school, we worked with the grandmother, we got her connected, and next thing you know, she was zooming around. Uh, and able to help her, uh, the third grader who was in her care at that you know, particular time. Um, I can tell you our teachers have had to and are continuing to come up to speed to figuring out how to use the technology, to figuring out how to best use the technology to not just deploy the technology, but to use it in a way that is engaging for students. And I would say that we still have you know, some you know, uh, educators have figured it out and maybe they were ahead already or they've learned it since then and are just really engaging uh, their learners very much. Other educators are still working through that, still struggling, still trying to say like, how am I going to do this? What is this necessarily going to look like? Um, at the department, we have offered a number of trainings, many of which have been uh, video recorded and are out on that website I gave you earlier. Um, we have created a what we refer to as a professional learning community, a PLC on a platform called um, Learning Design, uh, and that allows the educators kind of an online community to ask questions of one another and figure out how they can uh, solve problems with their peers. Um, and so there's been quite a lot of engagement around that, um, which is kind of interesting to see. So um, again, that learner attitude across the, across the board for everybody has really helped us solve problems um, and not just get stuck when, uh, when there is an issue. Um, so it's been very successful in that sense. All right, Chairman Klein, as the commissioner stated, New Hampshire made our transition very quickly to remote learning and we were better prepared than a lot of states. Why do you think specifically this is? What did we do differently to get us to this position? And how can we, oh, yeah. sorry, how can we no. build on this advantage? Um, so I can't speak to exactly how every other state does it, of course, but one of the advantages we have in New Hampshire is that we are so de decentralized and um, superintendents and principals do have quite a bit more autonomy in New Hampshire than in some other states. Um, I think we can enable that more as we go forward, but um, I think that decentralization, uh, excuse me, decentralization really helped. And I think the attitude, like the commissioner said, um, 
of everyone wanting to make sure that we didn't lose any time helped a lot. The commissioner's office and the department did an absolutely fantastic job of being a resource and being available to help. And I think that was huge. There was not this big disconnect from the districts to the state. I think the commissioner brought everyone together and set a great tone of cooperation and helpfulness, not of, hey, it's our way of the highway. <laughs> um, the tone was very much, what do you need and how can we help you? And that goes a really long way. When you have a department that is actively reaching out to the districts to help, to enable, to focus on the kids and finding ways to make it work in each district, understanding that districts are different. So some districts have a lot of resources and a lot of parent engagement. Other districts have very few resources and very little parent engagement. The department really understood that. The districts had a very good sense of what their weaknesses and strengths were and being able to cooperate and work together, I think was really huge. And finding ways to make it work in each district was something that enabled the districts to ramp up super fast. And to me, that was just a testament to the way we do business in New Hampshire. It's very cooperative. And I think that just, you can look at some other states um, and you can see the dysfunction in the sort of top-down structure that they have. Um, where the culture is more of looking to the state for, um, for guidance um, and direction more than for help. Um, but another, uh, another reason I think for that is that we have, um, we have in New Hampshire um, sort of a culture of um, finding what works for the child. And so in New Hampshire, we have um, a system, for example, we went to a long time ago now that is focused on competencies. So in New Hampshire, students are supposed to, our education is supposed to be competency-based. So students are measured on their progress year to year by competencies, not seat time and varying there's varying degrees of how well that works in districts, but we went to that shift a while back. So I think New Hampshire was much better prepared to put in place a system that is focused on getting kids to their competency rather than checking attendance and measuring based on, you know, are they in class? Are they spending this amount of time on these subjects? It's much easier to do remote learning when you can essentially give kids um, homework assignments. Now different districts and different teachers do this differently even within the same school. Some teachers we see are doing um, basically just giving kids a lot of homework and checking it. Some teachers are structuring their classes like it's a school day and they have Google classes where they all meet. Some kids or teachers are giving sort of video lessons. So there's a, a great deal of flexibility in, in how teachers can conduct their classes. That also, I think, has led to a great deal of success. So for example, you have teachers at the high school level who are conducting full-on classroom lectures and organizing everybody to participate at the same time. You have some teachers who are not, that's not really their strength. They don't feel comfortable doing that with the technology. So they're finding ways to make it work for themselves. So having that flexibility and having the competency-based system that we already have, I think has really put New Hampshire in um, a great position. And it's why I, th I think, even though as commissioner said, there are some areas we still need to work on and there certainly are challenges, um, but that's enabled us to really do this well quickly. I mean, I. I talked to a superintendent today who had mentioned talking to someone from another state who had a, there was a district that has been 
their school's been closed about as long as uh, his districts had, as we in New Hampshire have, um, and they haven't even begun remote learning yet. It's been weeks, and that doesn't happen in New Hampshire. Um, and another reason, just to throw attack the last one on there, is um, we haven't accepted that. I think the state saying, nope, there's no excuses here. The kids are going to learn. We will give you whatever help and whatever resources we need, and we will work with you to help those families that really need it the most. There are families in crisis. There are families with special needs kids that are very difficult to teach remotely. But I credit the state for saying, and, and the superintendents who've been all, you know, I, I can't speak to all, but from my knowledge, um, willing to and eager to make sure that kids are learning um, and that we will do what it takes to make sure those kids learn. And I think that is just a wonderful spirit. I was really happy to see that, um, that we are not saying, well, we have some challenges, so we're just gonna end school, nobody can learn. I think that's exactly the wrong approach. And I think New Hampshire took the right approach. So Shannon, actually, I'll just add one more thing, which is I would describe it as uh, unbridled and contagious enthusiasm and optimism for making this thing work. And uh, that has taken us a long way. Um, and I guess I also want to just, you know, lean in a little bit and make sure that it's clear, like, this has not happened without hiccup, right? There's still stuff happens every day that we're trying to figure out. Um, so the issue is we don't, when we have uh, something that isn't working well, rather than dwell on the fact that it's not working well, we try and figure out, well, what's the solution? How can we solve this problem? How can we move it forward? So um, part of our ability to move quickly, uh, and, and sometimes I describe it as, um, you know, building the plane as we fly it, uh, is because we're willing to continue to work on the system. We didn't, we're not presuming that we have all the answers, but we're presuming that we have the ability to figure out the solutions as the problems evolve, as opposed to some other states, maybe we're saying like, well, let me figure out all the permutations and how this thing's all gonna come together, and then we'll launch it. Um, you know, I think that our approach has actually been really effective because we've learned a lot and gotten, uh, we have this kind of very rapid development cycle uh, to implement, um, you know, effective changes for the system as we're moving along. So with that unbridled and contagious enthusiasm, um, how do you help the people who have poor or limited internet access at this time? Um, how are they adapting and what resources is the state using to help them? Yeah, so that is a great question and one that we knew, like when we uh, were on the runway getting ready to fly this plane that wasn't yet built, we knew that uh, New Hampshire had a lot of rural spots and little nooks and crannies that may not have great service. Um, and so we didn't launch this saying like, oh, we can't start until everybody has you know, 25 down, three up, you know, internet capacity at their homes. Um, so we launched it, recognizing that those students who didn't have that, we would potentially go to an analog type of a system while we continue to solve those problems. And again, what's happened is you've seen kind of these partnerships, I call them public-private type partnerships that have developed um, to where we've got students who didn't have computers. And so we've reached out to businesses in those communities. I personally talked to the business owners and said, hey, can you help us here? And those businesses, uh, sometimes new computers, sometimes um, you know, used computer equipment that they had in their corporations that they were willing to donate uh, so that next thing you know, the seventh grade class is online and they're up and running. All of our uh, internet providers in the state, every single one of them we reached out to, they all offered a free program. So there was no excuse for families to be able to not gain access um, through one of these free programs that was available to them. And these weren't your typical free programs. You know, sometimes you have those free programs, but if you can't pass the credit check, they won't let you in. Or if you have an outstanding bill, they won't let you in. But they waived all of that and are working with all of our families to do that. In one particular rural area, we had, um, I, I'm even gonna mention a company, so Consolidated. So their entire circuit, their switch basically, was full in that area. They couldn't accommodate any more connections. But I had a kid in a house who needed to get a connection. Consolidated literally like upgraded their circuit to be able to accommodate this new house in that area to be able to do that. 
I can tell you we reached out to our wireless providers. Uh, so as and actually it was interesting because we were negotiating with AT, or with Verizon to basically just get a program for students. Um, I don't know anybody else who's a Verizon customer out there may have noticed that all of a sudden Verizon just bumped all of your data caps to uh, 15 gigabytes and bytes and they're not slowing down the, the plans at all. I mean, that was as a result of saying, like, we need to do something for the students. And they said, you know what? It's just easier for us to do it across the board. AT&T, on the other hand, they came up with a very specific program. So if you're a, a student and you have an AT&T program, uh, you're able to... Uh, there's a program that you can sign up through and you have unlimited data for the rest of the semester to be able to gain access to that. So I don't know if any of you heard what we did over in Rochester. Uh, so there are there was some spotty access there. Um, and it wasn't so much that the carriers didn't have access, but families didn't have access and didn't always have the capacity to be able to get connected. Uh, so literally, uh, you know, they purchased hotspots, they put them on their buses and they park the buses out in the parking lot in the apartment complex so that the, the students can connect that way. Um, another district down in the Conville area, they went out and they purchased a number of hotspots um, and they got some data plans for those hotspots to allow families who were in these really remote spots that otherwise couldn't get connected to get connected. Um, and so what I've really tried to encourage is, you know, sometimes in these, uh, you know, in large system moves that you're trying to make, you're trying to make these broad policy decisions that affect everybody, the result of which is that some people fall through the cracks. And so our approach is very different. We just solve as many problems as we can. And what happens is the cracks fill themselves in. So as problems are coming up, we address them head on and we say like, what can I do to fix this problem today? And then I don't have that tomorrow and I can go on to the next problem. So that is kind of the approach that we have in terms of closing that, uh, particularly the digital divide. And then the last program I'll mention is in Manchester. Uh, you know, I, think that, I think something about lemonade, like making lemonade out of lemons or something, you know, uh, but they had a, you know, a consortium of businesses and some other education folks uh, who came together to really work on that digital divide for some of our families in Manchester and close that. And they've also been very successful in that. So it's really, again, a bit of an all hands on deck type of an approach uh, and, a, and a bit of everybody willing to try and solve problems. And that kind of an approach has really allowed us to make a lot of progress. Yeah, and I don't have much to add to that. I, I can say there are quite a few districts that have been um, buying personal hotspots. Um, I mean, some have bought hotspots for a family so that family can can have a connection. And and um, I believe Frank uh, could, could you, you, I think you mentioned at the beginning um, that not everybody's on the internet. Not all this is, some of this is done on paper. So, um, you know, the mindset of just finding a way to make it work and solving the problem has been um, really a joy to watch. It was, it was interesting, Drew, when we were first getting ready to roll this out and everybody's like, well, everybody doesn't have access to the internet. And uh, I hate to describe this, but some of us are old enough to remember that there wasn't always internet ubiquitous around us, right? And there was a whole bunch of people learning. So you're just kind of like, well, wait a minute, just because there's not internet doesn't mean that learning has to stop. There's ways to do it. And we just have to be willing to uh, open up our minds and say like, okay, what can we do here? So. All right. So I have the million dollar question here for both of you. What is the plan if we can't return to school for the rest of the year in person? Will summer remote learning be an option? And how will students get credits that they need to advance? You want to go first? How, yeah, I can go first if you want. Not a problem at all. So uh, that is the, the um, $64,000 question in terms of summer. So just to, and I know this isn't directly to the question, but I think it's important information that I put out there. And that is, um, you know, so we have uh, May 4th is our next evaluation date that we are looking at in terms of deciding whether or not we continue this or not. Uh, the way that we've been describing this initially, uh, we started out on a sprint, which had our first evaluation date of April 3rd. Um, then our sprint turned into a 10K to bring us through May 4th. And now the question is, will this become a marathon? And are we prepared to run a marathon? Um, and part of, you know, being successful in a marathon is pacing in terms of your ability to get that done. 
Um, I know that the governor is looking at lots of different uh, pieces of data to try and um, figure out, is this something that's going to continue or not continue? Um, he is hopeful that he will be able to make a decision on something like that by the end of the week, uh, bearing in mind that a lot of the the health-related and safety-related information is changing on a daily basis, um, and so it may we may find ourselves in a circumstance where that um, decision has to wait a little bit longer. Um, but today, uh, you know, the indication is that it may continue beyond the fourth, and it may continue for the remainder of uh, the semester. Now, part of what you asked was, um, you know, how are students going to get credits? Well. As it turns out, the kids are learning right now. So in terms of getting credits, they're working on those credits right now. Um, and we anticipate that they will be able to earn those credits um, in this remote instruction uh, and support learning environment that we have created for them. So uh, this is not a busy work time. This is a, uh, a, an opportunity for students to learn. Again, some, some of the learning, particularly early on, was maybe not as smooth as it could have been, but we are continuing to ramp up and continuing to grow. So the goal is for students to be able to, uh, to learn and to earn those credits. Um, I do know that the governor is evaluating what does this mean if, we, if, if the May 4th date continues through the end of the school year, what does that mean relative to the summer? And I think it might be premature to decide what that looks like. We have a lot of ESY that takes place, so extended, extended school years uh, for many of our students on individual education plans. Uh, we've got a lot of summer programming that takes place for students and summer camps as well are beginning to develop. Um, probably a little bit early to make a call relative to summer programming and what that will look like. Um, I just I know that the governor is evaluating it and trying to, to make a determination, but uh, we haven't gotten past May 4th, so I don't want to get ahead of myself in terms of you know what that might look like. Um, but certainly, uh, every expectation is that students will be able to continue to uh, earn those credits. I would tell you the only place that we are you know looking at very carefully is around some of our career and technical education programs. So these are students that are working on things like, uh, you know, a CNA or an ASEA in the automotive, or they're in a welding program or manufacturing program, um, or some other type of program that requires uh, really access to some equipment and some programmatic um, supplies uh, to be successful. And so we're trying to look at what that might look like for some of those students who don't have the opportunity to have some of those um, hands-on experiential learning experiences, which go hand in hand with that type of instruction. Um, and how do, how do we, you know, kind of make sure that we get them across the line? So for example, a student in a cosmetology program uh, is required to get up to 400 hours of experience uh, working in that environment. And this type of a disruption might disrupt their ability to earn those hours. And those are the hours that are not just recognized by the education system, but are recognized by the industry partners as well. So whether it's in cosmetology or in automotive programs or in a welding program, uh, to earn those industry certificates, they need to actually get some hands-on experience. So we're just looking at various options for how we can make sure that we close that gap. Um, and I hope I you answered the that. question there. <laughs> I, I would just add to that to leave you with two points. One is that districts are working right now on plans gaming out what might happen through the rest of the year. So there were right now districts are working on how does it work if the kids all come back to school uh, after May 4th? They're working on how does it work if we remote learn for a few more weeks into May and how does it work if we remote learn all the way to the end? So those are plans that are being laid out at the district level to try to anticipate and be ready for whatever order comes down. So um, all the districts are doing that, and um, I expect they'll be ready for whatever happens. Number two, the school buildings are closed, but education isn't stopped. I think that's the critical thing to real realize for people on the outside who maybe don't have kids, <laughs> is that the school year is continuing. Kids are learning. Education is happening. Just because the building is closed doesn't mean that we're out of school. So the expectation is students are learning. They are expected to meet those competencies. They are expected to learn and complete their school year. And I think that is sort of the big takeaway here. 
um, for people not to confuse having the building shut down with having school out of session. As it turns out, Drew, you can't actually shut down learning, right? So one of the things when we first walked into this thing, you know, uh, I, I was like, kids are going to learn, you know, whether we do, we provide some, you know, uh, programming to them or not. The question is, what are they going to learn? And so given the choice of imperfection or perfection, I thought, well, better imperfection and they're learning stuff that we think is important than uh, learning a bunch of stuff that maybe isn't going to be that valuable to them in the long run. So learning continues in New Hampshire. You're muted, Sharon. Sorry, I double clicked it there accidentally. Um, as you mentioned, education in New Hampshire is very individualized. So what resources are being allocated to special needs students who um, need that one-on-one -on -one in person attention. Has this transition to remote learning been going well for uh, students with special needs? Can can you share anything with that? I would absolutely love to. And I don't know, Drew, if you want to weigh in on this, but this is something that I spend a ton of my time on trying to make sure that uh, no soldiers are going to get left on this battlefield. We're bringing everybody along. We're going to close the gaps for every single student. Um, so early on, we built what I refer to as kind of a three-tiered safety net for our students with individual education plans. And literally, that involved going through every individual plan and identifying the services and the supports that were being provided, and then going through a tiered system in terms of figuring out how we could support that student. Uh, the first tier is, is this the, you know, the support service that's called out in the IEP something that can be provided in a remote instruction and support environment? And many of those services are such that you can provide them in a remote instruction and support service. Uh, the IEPs talk about what needs to be done for the student, but not necessarily the mode of delivery for those students. And so if it was possible, we just shifted the mode in terms of how we were doing that support service. The second tier really was continuing to be able to offer in-person supports for those students. Um, even with all of the, the various um, you know, orders that are in place, um, it is still possible to have you know, small cohort one-on-one -on -one contact with these students to provide those types of services. Um, many of our schools have, you know, they've maybe pulled back from that, but we've got a number of service providers in our communities who are available and enthusiastic about continuing to try and support students that may have very specialized needs. Um, I can talk about a, you know, a, a particular child in a district. Um, this is a six-year-old child with some severe disabilities. Uh, they were providing, they were getting a lot of services uh, you know, while they were in that school environment, when we shifted to the remote instruction and support, um, the school itself was uh, not in a position to be able to provide those direct services like they had been in the past. But we worked with the district and we got set up with Easter Seals. And so Easter Seals is providing services to this young child today um, and making it work. Uh, today, I also uh, talked to a parent and a superintendent about another, you know, there's these two, uh, two twins um, you know, uh, on the autistic spectrum who uh, mom was concerned because the remote instruction that they were receiving initially or have been receiving didn't seem like that, you know, the mom was thinking like, I don't think it's as effective. It's not getting the job done. She felt like there was some regression taking place for their, for her autistic kids. Um, so worked with the district, found some, a third party provider, you know, an outside provider that is going to be able to support them. And so the school district will shift that over and allow that to take place. Um, it hasn't been seamless. There have been some districts that have been a little bit slower uh, to the uh, to the game in this regard, but we continue to work with them. Um, I'm thinking of there was one district where we were providing uh, speech therapy, but without video. And, uh, you know, the parents like, this is not working. Like, we got to do something for this, you know. And so we worked with the district and we were able to get to the point where they were, they felt comfortable providing uh, video access for those services. Uh, but again, it's you just have to identify each individual circumstance and then work on it. 
And then the last tier of this safety net is really what I refer to as compensatory services, is acknowledging that in this disruptive environment, uh, we don't have the ability to support uh, the needs of a particular student as it's called out for in their individual education plan, uh, recognizing that that may mean that that student falls behind in terms of their goal attainment, um, and recognizing that when we move beyond this environment, we're going to have to do some stuff to try and make up some lost ground for those students. Um, so that is the kind of that three-tiered approach that we have um, that we've applied, uh, you know, here in New Hampshire. And I can tell you, having conversations with other states, um, it's a, a kind of a, a tiered system that other states have embraced as well and are, and are trying to deploy to support their students as well. Yeah, and if I can just tack onto that, the critical part is, is the end. No student is allowed to fall behind or put it this way no district is allowed to let a student fall behind <laughs> they will be caught up that's the goal and that's the plan and that's what we're all working towards you know shannon i just i'm going to add one more thing on this too um it was interesting so somebody asked me one day if if we've lowered our expectations uh for our students here in new hampshire given the circumstances that we find ourselves in and, um, and I was just like, absolutely not. You know, we still have very, very high aspirations for our children, but we also recognize that we're in kind of this transitionary mode that we're delivering in, um, and it's not going to be perfect, and we're going to continue to grow, and we're going to get better. But those two ideas don't have to be incongruent. We can hold high aspirations and simultaneously hold the recognition that we're working towards those aspirations um, and they don't have, you don't have to lower your expectations. So I think it's important that we communicate that we've not lowered our expectations. We basically are recognizing that the, uh, you know, our, the, the approach that we have in terms of getting there is different. Both of you have mentioned New Hampshire's ability to pivot and uh, recognize needs. Have any educational gaps been exposed um, that existed before this transition that you have been able to now fix? <laughs> you mean using remote learning to fix? Uh, yes, using um, the new tools at hand to fix. Well, I think if you're talking about the gaps in learning that exist, um, you can break that down in a lot of ways. I mean, you can look at the numbers and show that, you know, students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are, have a gap um, versus students from higher backgrounds. Um, you can look at minority students. There's a lot of gaps that show up in the data. Those aren't being um, exposed by remote learning. I mean, those are all there and we know. Um, I think it would be tough to say in a couple of weeks that remote learning has um, become a tool immediately to you know, quickly close that gap, uh, any of those gaps. But um, from what I'm hearing from administrators is they know they know the families that are struggling. I mean, you talk to principals and superintendents and they, they know exactly which children are struggling. The teachers know, they know where the problems are and where extra help and extra effort is needed. Um, I think remote learning and for some families is giving, uh, is creating, you know, challenges that the districts are gonna, um, that they are actively addressing. And for some families, it's creating opportunities. So, um, you know, it's a new tool in our toolkit right now. That's the kind of the way I'm looking at it. And I know the commissioner can speak in more detail. Um, but from, from the state board level, at least, I look at it as um, <clears throat> a tool that we can use. We are always focused on narrowing those gaps. I know the commissioner is personally committed to that. I am committed to that. That's one of the passions we I have and that a lot of state board members have is trying to figure out ways to close those gaps. And if we can figure out ways to use remote learning and 
to use personaliz uh, personalization as a way to close those gaps, um, we're all for it. And I think that's one of the things we're looking at. I don't think we have any answers right now, but we're looking at what's working and what's not working and how we can, you know, ad adopt, adapt in this situation. Do you want to give some more detail on that? Well, so I guess I will. I just I'm I'm listening to what you're how you're responding, um, and I think you know in the in the question, kind of there's this premise um, that uh, there's these gaps in this remote instruction environment. And what we have to recognize is there were gaps in the other system too. Uh, in other words, like so, we don't want to start with the assumption that there were no gaps, and now we're in this environment, and so there are we're revealing gaps in our in our current system, if I understood the question correctly, um, what we have to understand is that there were gaps previously, there are gaps today, and we have to continue to close gaps uh, for all students. Um, and so I think inevitably what you will find is when you see a shift like this, there were some students who were succeeding quite well in the traditional instructional model that we existed in two months ago. Um, when we made the shift, some of those students who succeeded in the old model are struggling in this new model, but there were students who struggled in the old model that are succeeding in this current model. And so we really are trying to, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's this system or another system, the goal is to find the students who are struggling and try to find how do we unlock, uh, you know, opportunity for them as I guess one way of describing them. Right, and that, and, and that's why when I, when I started my answer, um, you know, I tried to point out that there are students who um, are families that have found challenges under this model, but there are other students and families that have really embraced it. Um, some of the districts are getting super positive feedback on it. Um, parents, um, again, some families have a real challenge, but a lot of parents have really engaged on this and found that it works for them. And I can speak from personal experience. I have three children in the public school system. All of them are remote learning right now. One of my sons is ecstatic about it. He's already asked me, dad, can I just do the rest of my school remote? He does not want to go back to the traditional school. He loves it so much and his grades are going up. So it, that is an example to illustrate that kids learn differently. And, you know, not every system and not every approach is going to work perfectly well for every kid. And that's something that we're taking from this to look forward is, you know, how can we adapt and create a system that works really well for everybody? You know, it's interesting. I just want to weigh in on this one more way, which was the other day I was with uh, Frank Bass, who's the superintendent over in um, at Concord. So a large system. And um we were talking and I was, you know, we were just sharing about uh, the transition and I was just saying like, you know, the New Hampshire teachers, uh, the New Hampshire uh, school leaders have really set the bar high for the nation in terms of all of the work that they had done. Um, but he was sharing a story with me. Um, and this is a superintendent who in this environment, he decided to teach a class. So he's teaching a class remotely because he's like, hey, I'm going to ask all my teachers to do it. I need to understand what this is like. And he was describing kind of a real transition or transformation that he was observing among the students. And he described how, you know, in the traditional system, you had a lot of students who were focused really on, sometimes I might refer to it as kind of the game of school, like, okay, if I do this and I do this, then you'll give me a good grade and that'll be good. And so they were more interested in how they attained the measures of success than actually learning. And what he was saying is those kids who were saying like, well, how do I get a, an A or what do I have to, you know, what are the hoops that I have to jump through? They were just genuinely, he goes, they're just genuinely interested in the learning now and have kind of pushed aside. They're not so focused on the fact that like, well, if I do this, will you give me a reward? You know, so that reward system was gone and just the, the pleasure of engaging with their um, some of their, you know, their student, their fellow students online, engaging in the material, just going deep in terms of learning. Um, he had observed was uh, was happening among his student you know population. Now I don't know if that's you know rampant across the state. I sure hope it is uh, because if it is, then whereas New Hampshire set a high bar, 
if that's what's happening through this process, that we now have students who are engaged and just more interested in the learning than the game of school, then we've just raised the bar even higher. And that is pretty exciting to me. All right, we've talked a lot about kind of a, a macro standpoint, what the, the state has done, what the districts have done. What about teachers? Um, what resources are there for teachers to uh, deal with all the adjustments, to learn and to discuss new strategies and uh, new ways of, of teaching? And also have educators been responding positively to all the changes? So I would say, uh, so first of all, uh, we, do kind of, we do need to give a big thank you and shout out to our teachers because they have really stepped up. And, um, and I know that they are working uh, hard every day to try and figure out how they can support their students. And so we just so appreciate the work that they're done and, and how much they have committed um, towards this. Um, we have uh, leaned in as a department to set up a number of resources. So again, I would point people back to nhlearnsremotely.com, uh, set up lots of resources for educators out there to be able to engage. Uh, I talked about the learning designed platform, this PLC or professional learning community platform that we set up. Um, and then we have done just, you know, I, I, it almost might be countless, I'm sure you can count them, but countless numbers of uh, trainings and uh, online engagement uh, opportunities for educators to be able to fill in gaps as they're figuring this out. But it's really not just the department. The whole state um, has, in, in a lot of different communities, have jumped in. I mean, one of the first people that I reached out to was Steve Kozakowski, who runs VLAX, the Virtual Learning Academy in New Hampshire. I mean, these guys have been doing online instruction for a really long time. And I called him up. I said, Steve, you got to help me. And um, he was... What was really funny is I reached out to him thinking I was going to be accessing, uh, you know, resources and trainings for teachers specifically. He was like, the teachers are good, Frank. But then he put a whole series of things together for families. So all of a sudden, this is going to be different for families to have learners at home. And what does that mean? And how can they be successful? And so there's been a number of resources that have been rolled out to support the teachers uh, we put those into, you know, most of them are recorded so that the teachers can access them in a kind of an asynchronous type of a way when it's convenient to them and accessible to them, uh, but have done, you know, as much as we can to try and make sure that we're getting them the support and the resources that they need uh, to be successful. All right. I have a question that has come up about homeschooling changes right now. So all of these um, public school kids have moved to remote learning. Homeschoolers are you know, stuck at home still doing their learning, but homeschoolers still have requirements for the state, um, specifically an end of year assessment or a portfolio. Now, given the um, that a lot of families are suffering economically, um, a number of homeschoolers have wondered if these requirements will still, um, if these will still be requirements for this year. Uh, so I'll go ahead and take that one, Drew, because I, I I know the answer to this one. Um, so just to be clear, uh, the waiver around the accountability assessment that was um, applied for only applies to the federal law. So we are at present working on an order with the governor um, because the our our traditional public schools are still under a state law that requires an accountability assessment. Um, and the governor is working on an order that would uh, encompass that as well as uh, some of the other accountability measures uh, relative to our home educated students, to some of our private schools and stuff like that, to look more broadly, not just, again, the waivers that we have so far are dealing with federal statutes, and now we're working through those state statutes. So you should see something like that, something around that topic happening probably within the next week. All right, um, Chairman Klein, one last question for you. As you mentioned, you're a parent of kids in public schools. Um, you mentioned one of your kids really loves this remote learning. How do you think in general, or what have you heard from parents and students about this new way of learning? Um, do you anticipate 
any students falling behind, even with all of the supportive measures and the individualized education that happens in New Hampshire? We are, <clears throat> so taking that a couple different ways. Um, anecdotally, you hear a lot of positive feedback. Um, you really do. There are uh, some families, again, I mentioned this before, who are, uh, for whom this is a real challenge. And if you've got several kids and you've got to teach them all at the same time at home and you're trying to work, um, it's, it's challenging. But we have teachers and administrators and, um, you know, a whole network here to support families. And that's what I think is the way you have to think about this is that remote learning <clears throat> is focused on learning. And you've got an entire state system that is focused on trying to get these kids educated and get them to those competencies. And there's a lot of improvisation going on and figuring out how we do that and how we best support those kids. Um, but I can tell you, I have heard from districts and from administrators a lot of positive feedback. Um, so I think on the whole, it's going very well. I think we, uh, again, have challenges in some pockets, but the, the big picture takeaway is that New Hampshire has done this very, very well. And we are not accepting the idea that kids are gonna fall behind. So I know administrators and teachers are working extremely hard to make sure that every kid gets the support and the education that they need and that they're required to have. Um, but again, kids learn differently and Families are in all kinds of different situations. And I think one of the big takeaways is we went from a system where we thought we knew how to educate every child. We had a system in place that was designed to do that with a specific delivery model. We suddenly had to turn on a dime and create an entire new delivery model. You can't, after a couple of weeks, say, well, there are a couple of families that are having a hard time uh, and the districts are working with them to make sure those kids are educated. But because some people have not had a perfect experience, it's a big problem It doesn't work. It's working extremely well statewide. And again, to think that we shifted from one model to an entirely different model with very little relative disruption is really impressive. Kids I guess getting... I also, if I could just, um, you know, reflect on that for a minute as well, because again, the premise of the, the question is a little bit around the idea that uh, because we have this shift to a new instructional model that some students are falling behind, and it, the premise is that in the old model, students were not falling behind. So students falling behind is not something new to education. Um, we have seen students fall behind in our old model, and we will see students fall behind in this model. This model is brand new. So it may be a little bit more persistent at this point in time, but it's way too early to understand what that even looks like having been doing this for three weeks. Um, but the idea of students falling behind is not something new. It's something that we should recognize in any system of education that we have, because anytime students are not engaging um, in the, the materials or in the instruction um, in a way that, uh, that brings them forward, they're going to fall behind. And so falling behind is not something new. The question is, how do you try to minimize the effect of anyone falling behind? And so, um, again, falling behind happened in the old system. Falling behind may happen in this system. But we continue to, again, not allow ourselves to leave any soldiers on the field. And we make sure that we find out who's falling behind and how do we fill in those gaps. And, again, I, and that would be the approach whether we're here or we were two months ago. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's where – you know, to get back to one of the first answers I gave in the very beginning of the session, um, you know, were asking about how it might, how school might look different in the future. Well, the commissioner's right. 
kids fall behind under the existing model that we've had. And we have a lot of data to show that. Some of those kids are gonna perform much better in this remote learning environment than they did in the previous environment. One of my concerns is that we don't leave those kids behind when we go back, if we go back, I'm, you know, we're all fingers crossed that we go back to a regular school system in the fall, but we have to understand that not every kid learns the same way. Some of the kids who struggled under the old system are gonna do very well with remote learning. We need to make sure that we can adapt and that those kids don't fall behind and fall back into the same problems they had before when we get back to normal in the fall. Um, you know, that's a big concern that I think we have to keep an eye on. We have a tool now that we can use for a lot of students. They're going to want to use that when the fall comes around. And that's going to be an interesting development is to see how we can accommodate those needs when the new school year starts. So we've covered most of the uh, questions from the audience here, but we do have two more that I'd really like to get to. Um, so these will be for either one of you. Uh, so how is students' privacy being protected through remote learning? So I think I can go ahead. And <clears throat> Let me go ahead and answer that, Joe. Sorry to clear my throat here. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we did when we were moving to, uh, you know, remote instruction and support is we recognize the importance of student privacy. Uh, we do know that there are a ton of applications out there. Um, and so what we did is, again, if you go out to nhlearnremotely.com, what we did is we had a three-tier vetting system in terms of privacy licensing for all of the different applications. Um, in New Hampshire, under RSA 189.66, uh, basically the Department of Education is required to set what's referred to as kind of minimum standards for student privacy. And then local school districts in this, you know, local control type of environment are required to implement local policies around student policy. Um, what's ha what, as a result of that, what happened is all different schools had all different kinds of policies that at least met the minimum standards, but sometimes maybe were beyond those minimum standards in various areas. So one of the orders, I believe it was order number four by the governor said, well, um, so actually there's three different tiers. So the first is if a school district has already vetted an application for student privacy and it meets their local policy, then we know it at least meets the minimum standards. And so we said that would be an acceptable application to be able to use. Um, there's another, there's an organization called COSIN. It's a nationwide organization that deals with student privacy and they vet a number of applications. And so as, uh, you know, students or school systems were looking at different applications, we looked to see if it wasn't already approved by a school district, is it uh, an application that um, is approved by COSIN, in which case it also meets the minimum standards. And then if a school district was interested in using an application that didn't have one of those two criteria, we actually had the, uh, the security information officer for the state, a guy named Dan uh, Ditz, Disty, I think his name is. Uh, so he basically went through the, the software licensing agreements to validate that, um, that the software policies associated with those licenses would meet the state minimum standards. And so the order that we put in place was that the governor did, it says, as long as an application meets the minimum standards, then a district is allowed to use that. So for example, that, then we know at least it met the minimum standards. So you could have, as opposed to everybody having different standards because each local district came up with their own uh, student information security policy, everybody now is operating, operating off of the same one, which are the state minimum standards for student privacy. I don't know, I think, does that help answer that question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. um, we have one last question. Um, is there a way for parents and families to submit information to the State Board of Education or the commissioner on what is working and what needs to be fixed? And I would also add to that and say, I know there were a lot of questions tonight and we probably did not get to everybody's question. So if somebody still has something they'd like to ask, how do they get in touch with you? Great. Let me go first, Drew, and then I'll let you finish up here. Um, so if you go to the Department of Education website, uh, you know, so it's um, 
nh.doe.gov um, or just Google Department of Education. I know that will get you there. Uh, we've set up a um, online help system. So you can pose a question online and then we will curate those and we publish those out as a knowledge base. So a lot of times what happens is the questions repeat. And so you may find the answer to your question in our knowledge base already. So you can just pose the question out there. Uh, and then if we get, you know, we, yours may be a very unique question that we just respond directly to you. Or if it's a question that we've gotten a lot of times or we get a lot of times, we'll publish the, in the knowledge base, the actual answer to um, those questions so that you can get that. And then there was a second part to your question, Sarah, what was that? Um, so just if somebody has uh, feedback on how this is going, on um, something that's really uh, yes. working well or something that's not working well. Yep. And then, uh, so if it's not working well, you can call Drew. No, uh, <laughs> um, if it's not working well, please pick up the phone and call me uh, because we want to try and solve problems for you. If it is working well, that I will encourage you to go to a hashtag that we created called hashtag NH Learns Remotely hashtag NH learns remotely and share your uh, success stories out there for us all to benefit from. Um, and again, I'm just going to close out here and I know Drew will finish up, but thank you so much for, uh, for joining us online. I really appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you and let you know what's going on with remote learning and in New Hampshire. And I just add to that, um, look, the Board of Education, um, all members would really enjoy hearing from constituents and um, you know, hearing how it's going. So you can go to education.nh.gov. And if you go to the right hand side, there's a tab that says who we are, and you can scroll down on that to find the State Board of Education. All of our bios and email addresses are on there. You can email me um, as the chair, or you can email um, the board member from your district. There Board members are appointed by executive council district. So you can find your district there and uh, connect with your board member and let us know how it's going for you. Awesome. Well, we want to say, first of all, thank you so much uh, to our to our guests, uh, Commissioner Edelblue and Chairman uh, Klein, as well as as well as our, our um, moderators, Sharon Osborne and Sarah Scott. Uh, this is our first night of, of a two night installment. Tomorrow night, we're actually going to be uh, having parents, educators, as well uh, as as well as uh, just having uh, some people in the in the public get together, form a panel to uh, be able to talk through their experiences. Um, some homeschool parents who've been doing this for a while to offer tips and tricks that they might have come up with through the years. Uh, so this, that's going to be tomorrow night. This is more about uh, this is tonight's been more about a policy at a policy level. Uh, tomorrow night's going to be more about at an operational level how parents who are now uh, dealing with this very quick transition to remote learning uh, can do the best job they can for their, for their uh, children and to give them uh, every opportunity to be successful. I wanna give uh, just a little, bit, uh, a little bit of a thank you as well. Uh, some folks who we work with closely, an organization called Yes Every Kid. Uh, it's a great organization. They have a website called learneverywhere.org. I know it's, it just happens to have the same name as a, as a program here in New Hampshire that's uh, gotten a lot of attention late, lately, but it's learneverywhere.org. They have uh, education toolkits uh, designed specifically for parents who are now uh, in this new uh, remote learning environment. I also want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Chris Maidman, the uh, Granite Standards for Education Reform, who really did a lot of hard work in promoting this event. And, uh, and has been a, a great partner in terms of uh, advancing K-12 uh, K through 12 awareness across uh, state government. Uh, this has been a, a, great, a great evening. Uh, we only thought this would go about 45 minutes. It's gone an, almost an hour and 20. So it, I think it, it shows just how much interest there is uh, in, this, in this issue uh, with the, to a large audience as well. So uh, thank you so much to the, all the participants again tomorrow night, eight o'clock. Love to have you back to hear about it from uh, the parent and the educator side and to maybe give some folks who are new to this whole uh, experience a little bit more uh, guidance and, and some help. Uh, so any last comments uh, by Drew and or Frank? Oh, just thanks everybody. Yes, thank you so much. And again, if you have any um, questions, please reach out to the department and I would encourage you to visit nhlearnsremotely.com. Awesome, thank you so much everybody. 
Uh, we really appreciate it. Those folks here at Americans for Prosperity want to make sure that everybody has a chance to be as successful as possible with this remote learning environment and to connect you with the people who are just like uh, a lot of you are struggling with this new transition. Just show that the, the folks who are really putting uh, every bit of emphasis they can into, into making this as successful as possible and who have made this transition as successful as possible for the students and families across New Hampshire. So thank you and good evening. Good night.